I was, I'm, I've been convinced since the 19, late 60s, when I uh, read uh, the Molina and Rowland's uh, article on the uh, erosion of the ozone layer, when they concluded, what the hell else has escaped us? That uh, we are uh, 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 undermining our own existence. And uh, the environmental problem, of course, has worsened since then. Uh, and we are trying to solve an environmental problem with a problematic brain. Never since Narcissus looked at uh, the reflection of his face on the river and fell in love with it, has there been such an adoration of a bodily organ as there is now of the brain, and never with uh, as little justification. And I'll mention to you the triple delusion at the time I completed my presentation, but I'll say to you uh, just a little experience I've had with my granddaughter of eight years of age. I asked her to tell me, uh, what will you do today that does not pollute? And she said, running. And I said, good, but uh, if you run, you wear out your shoes and the companies will have to make more shoes and that pollutes. Uh, running barefoot. And I said, that's very good, but if you run, you increase your appetite and there will have to be more trucks bringing in food for you uh, in eat, uh, to eat in the city. More chickens will be decapitated to feed you. Uh, she said, then sitting in a chair. I said, that's very nice, but uh, to make a chair, you have to cut a tree. Then lying on the ground naked. Uh, it's hard to think of something you would do that doesn't pollute. Uh, and um, uh, while uh, uh, at it, the attitude of humans, of who we are, that is, which philosophy has a lot to say, and of course Darwin has a lot to say, uh, is interesting that it is really a hubris. And I was trying to explain to her uh, what uh, hubris was, and, and uh, I mentioned to her uh, the story of Sisyphus. I said, this uh, king of Corinth uh, in ancient Greece uh, was condemned by the gods to push a rock straight up the mountain during the day only for it to fall down again, and have to push it up again the next day because he was narcissistic, egotistical, and insulting. She said, like Trump. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is hubris in humans. And uh, there is Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. <laughs> so I'll take you through uh, a journey through the brain to what some philosophers and neuroscientists said about the brain, then I will show you some photos of the places the book is said. And now, here, I wanted to do an atlas of the human brain, having done an atlas of the rat brain. Uh, but before doing so, I thought of trying uh, to make an atlas of uh, the brain of another primate, uh, non-human one, where I could get the brain on short period of postmortems. For the human, you have to wait eight, eight hours, by which time uh, things degrade, and you don't get as good staining, you don't have the power uh, then. So I wrote to the Toronto Park Zoo for the opportunity to do, to do a postmortem on a chimpanzee, once a chimpanzee died. This works, by the way? Yes. Good. Uh, and they replied, that was back in 1980, that they would be happy to oblige, but they had not had the death of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't suspect me, and I studied the brain of one of them. And uh, the brainstem led us to do an atlas of the human brainstem, because we knew what to expect. Once you know what to expect, you can find it. Uh, and uh, there's the atlas of the human brain cell, which was based on the work we did on uh, the uh, chimpanzee. And the external similarity you saw previously on the orangutan, I didn't have a chimpanzee to pose for me, uh, is actually reflected internally as well in the brain parts. They are also similar. <coughs> Indeed, the same, uh, homologous as we call them, there are no different parts in the brain of the chimpanzee in the brain stem that we studied in parallel with the human brain. No different. They are the same. <coughs> the 
guess what? This marmoset, a small primate, the size of a small rat, the parts of the brain are also the same with us. It's not the case for the rat. There are heterologous parts in the cortex, for example, for the rat and human. But in the marmoset, there seems to be no difference uh, between the parts of uh, the brain of the marmoset. Of course, you don't have gorillas in university studying uh, and, or chimpanzees. We think that the reason is that the brain is half the size of a human uh, and we don't have the synaptic buffer to uh, accommodate uh, the higher learning. Uh, you can get some language skills in the chimpanzee after maybe 3,000 words, which is equivalent something to a three-year-old child. Uh, and they can know the difference between the boy hit the ball and the ball hit the boy, uh, which have identical words in it. <coughs> and the cartoon can display one or the other, and they know which one is which. So they have cognitive capacity and some linguistic capacity, but certainly humans have far more of it, and presumably it's the size of uh, the brain that uh, makes uh, the difference. But internally, the parts are the same. Of course, the larger you are, anybody larger than me would likely have larger palm, larger stomach, and larger brain. Doesn't mean they're smarter because you have to account for the housekeeping functions of the brain, where also they have to be greater. And once you subtract those, you let, let, leave with the parts that are capable of higher cognitive thinking, and uh, then uh, that wouldn't be that different. Uh, and uh, the mama said, Look, we did the mama, it took me five years. Uh, and uh, the areas that you see here are the ones also you see in the uh, human brain. Now, here's the human brain. This is an atlas we're constructing now. We haven't published it yet. Uh, and the person is not uh, dead. It's one of us. Three of us are doing this work. And uh, here you'll see his brain in, uh, uh, from one side to the other as it moves. Hopefully, the video will play. And uh, that's it. We'll have to press one more. This one here. Yeah. Just click. Yeah, there you go. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, yeah, this is Mark Shira. He was my postdoc. He's now a lecturer at uh, Wollongong University. And uh, you can see his brain. And that's what you're studying now. The living brain. You might say, why not postmortem? Uh, you can get it from the morgue and, and you can cut it and find the teeth and slices. Well, uh, no, because you can see the colors which indicate the direction of fibers in the brain, which you don't see in the postmodern tissue. All right? Uh, so uh, we have some benefits out of studying the living the human uh, brain. And also we have the native space. You don't restore the brain by taking it out. Uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, the brain, a standardly modern view was expressed by Hippocrates. Men ought to know that from the brain, from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, jests, as well as our sorrows, pain, griefs, and tears. And unfortunately, Aristotle, possibly the greatest scientist of antiquity, uh, misjudged and uh, considered the brain to be there to cool the blood, air condition it. Uh, and unfortunately, well, you know what they say about professors, their greatness is measured by how long they manage to stymie progress in their field. And the adherents of Aristotle uh, kept his views alive for way too long. Uh, to the point uh, that Vesalius burned the books of the ancients. Uh, they wouldn't do observations, they would just follow uh, uh, Aristotle. And, but there was, uh, of course, Aristotle is known for other things too. Uh, he uh, set uh, the stage for logic, the logic of nature, who, uh, the theater of nature, where that uh, allowed Theophrastus 
uh, his pupil uh, to search for the relation between uh, light, uh, uh, climate, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, and plants and animals in uh, the behavior of humans and of animals. So it, the Ophrah source is the father of ecology. Uh, there's the Ophrah source. And uh, Aristotle uh, was uh, uh, ch viewed or challenged or rather by a follower of, of Hippocrates by the name of Galen, of Pergamon, and we see the relation between Kos and uh, Bergma, uh, Pergamon, in today's Turkey, uh, where Kos it was the island where Hippocrates was on, and uh, Pergamon where Galen was. And uh, uh, the encephalocentric view of Galen and cardiocentric view of Aristotle <coughs> battled with each other out for 1,300 years until the dawn of modern science. And you see here Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice says, tell me, Portia asks, where is fancy bread? Or in the heart, fancy in love, or in the head? And if you go today in Volga Junction on February 15th, you would see who won out. Was it Galen or was it Aristotle and the ancient Egyptians? You know, the ancient Egyptians heedlessly discarded the brain in funerary practices and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to the afterlife. And if you go to Bodai Junction, the pharaohs are alive. I went there to pick up a card for my girlfriend and I was confronted with 300 cards each of them with at least one red heart on them, none of them with a brain. And it forced me to write a letter in the newspaper. <laughs> Dad, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And a journalist from ABC Melbourne called me, are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, if in a heart transplant I get your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. <laughs> she said, what a pity, and he's such a lovely man. <laughs> Brain, equally beautiful, but true, also true. But there is a battle to localize the seed of the soul. Psychology loses its soul in the 1930s, with a psychologist in here. And uh, uh, she can vouch for us, I think, that uh, no psychologist uses the word soul. Nobody, not just a few nuts in some departments, just nobody used the word soul. And it would be cruel if you were to use it and say to a child that had uh, some behavioral difficulties, it's a autistic child, it's your soul, your soul. You could say that maybe some imbalance in uh, chemicals in your brain, uh, let's see what environmental modifications we can make to assist you in coping with circumstances, anything but blame the soul. Remember, psychoactive drugs, psychotherapeutic drugs, act on anything but the soul. And before giving a lecture like this to the <coughs> uh, clinical neuropsychologist of Australia, I went to the coffee hour, uh, in, uh, right before, and I asked him, uh, do you have a soul? The answer was always, pardon me, uh, they couldn't believe the question. Uh, eventually, one girl said, I had one until I started my PhD. <laughs> uh, there's no ghost in the machine, no, no soul for scientific considerations. If the soul is where emotion motivation resides, when mental activity occurs, sensations are perceived, memories are stored, love is manufactured, reasoning takes place, decisions are taken, then there's no need for hypothesis existence. There's an organ that already performs these functions. So, for psychology, 
The soul is surplus to requirements. Skinner behavior is the outcome of two and only two factors. Genetic endowment and environment. Skinner, I had the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, is there at least free will? I mean, what is left in those humans, poor humans? Alas, poor humans, what is left? Is there at least free will? Well, many neuroscientists, Skinner, uh, firstly, believe that uh, behavior is the outcome of two and only two factors over which we have no choice. Our genetic endowment, we don't select our uh, uh, parents, the environment, we don't select whether our mother was smoking, our grandmother was a drug addict, uh, epigenetic influences, or, or simply the environment, the early environment, um, the interuterine environment, uh, not if the society we are born in. If you are born in Iran, you're more likely to Afghanistan, more likely to be a Muslim. If you are born in France, more likely to be a Catholic or worse. <laughs> the book deals with identical beings raised apart. As different artists will sculpt different statues from the same block of marble, different environments will produce different characters, even in identical twins. The environment sculpts characters just as this unknown artist, possibly for years, sculpted Apollo from Parian marble in this statue from the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. The environment sculpts behavior, much like Praxiteles sculpted Hermes. Poor humans. They have no free will. None at all. There's no room in the march of genes environment for free will to will the limb and take part in the parade. And in one behavior, I think I can convince at least some of you that definitely there is no free will. Who has heard of love? Don't listen to me, listen to Carmen. L'amour, il n'y a jamais, jamais connu de loi. It, love has never known the law. And uh, you might say, oh, well, this is just academic stuff. Well, just look what's happening in the world. 50% uh, of the people who are abandoned by their partner interfere with their partner, or more than 50% actually, at their work, at their home, in the internet, some of them hit her, some of them kill her, some of them commit suicide. If only they listen to neuroscientists or philosophers, they would know that much like she, much like he cannot discard the love that torments him, she cannot make herself love him. <laughs> I hope I convinced some of you of the uh, view of Hippocrates that the brain is important. The question then is if the brain is the right size. If the brain were smaller, less clever, and capable of language than what it is, it would not have been able to produce the science and technology which threaten existence. If the brain was larger than what it is, humans might have been able to comprehend the problem even so, the conclusion is that the brain is not in the Goldilocks zone. The brain is not, the, my conclusion is, is not the right size. You've heard of the Goldilocks zone, right? Uh, you've heard of the Goldilocks zone? Right, the, let me see if I, yeah. Uh, the Earth is the right distance not to be burned by the sun or not to be frozen too far away from it. 
Goldilocks zone around the sun. Well, the brain is just not in the Goldilocks zone. If it was smaller, it would have been a problem. Monkeys are not threatening their existence in that of the other species. If it were larger, possibly, we could have understood the problem. Size in goats, of course. Uh, it's just uh, not the right size. Uh, and uh, we haven't understood those basic things that at least many neuroscientists believe. But by the way, what I'm telling you is probably the majority view in neuroscience, but the minority could be correct, right? We don't sort, sort, sort things out by majority vote, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the view is that we are slaves of yesterday. And uh, uh, the psychologists, well, we have one psychologist in here, the psychologists are extremely clever people. You wouldn't believe what they discovered. They discovered that today is tomorrow's yesterday. And they take people who have problems and they talk to them, cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this way, they can be their environment that they can assist them to overcome the obsessions, compulsions. They love without reciprocation. If we were free, would we not? be able to discard those things that torment us. Uh, unfortunately, not only humans don't understand that they are these shortcomings, that they are slaves of yesterday, that the brain cannot possibly make any decision but that which is the outcome of its genetic endowment and the influences that have molded it until yesterday. Tomorrow they might, might make another decision if today the information is different. But they believe, those humans, believe that they are made in the image of God. Look what happened here to poor Phaethon when he took the reins of the sun and was not doing a good job and Zeus sent the uh, thunderbolt to throw him down to earth, smashing himself on the rocks. The gods did not have much use for hubris, and uh, uh, yet uh, we uh, are committing that hubris. We think that we are making the image of God. If we dispel these notions and arm, or arm ourselves with the truth, that we don't know why we're on this planet, as uh, E.O. Wilson said. Puzzled, we stand before nature. We have a brain that has leftovers of the reptilian period. I've studied them. Uh, we have uh, paleolithic emotions. Medieval institutions would consider uh, the obsession that the Catholic Church has with sex. Forget about the sins that they commit with uh, uh, the way they've structured their, their church, but uh, simply trying to regulate whether you wear prophylactics or not, regardless as to whether that will assist you to prevent yourself from getting HIV or other the diseases, uh, the, uh, or believe diseases, uh, regardless of that, to assist you to plan your family. That they will not, they will prohibit that. And you might say, well, people don't listen to that. No, but foreign aid in the United States was once, was uh, contingent on a family planning program on the recipient country, now requires that there be no family pro uh, uh, program because the churches have influence evil influence. If that is not an evil influence of the church, then more crime is committed today in the name of God than in the name of the devil. Just look around. Not only really devil is around. And uh, uh, someone is complaining about what I'm saying. And, uh, uh, so I hope that armed with the truth uh, that uh, we are really part of primates with a larger brain, but carrying 
what has been endowed to us by nature. We might understand our place in this world uh, and uh, uh, change our course from uh, change our, the direction of our stern from the grave of our children to the dawn and make wings of our oars. <laughs>